There's a lot of topics that connect directly with stoichiometry. So what we're going to do here is go through some BCA table type questions that connect to other fields of chemistry beyond stoichiometry. So the first one here, we're going to look at some concentration chemistry applied to stoichiometry. And we have a whole bunch of information about this particular chemical reaction. So we have a volume and a concentration of sulfuric acid. And then it says that there's a chemical reaction that takes place between the two where sodium hydroxide is added until a color change indicating that the two amounts are equivalent uh, has happened. So that, that color change occurs at 222 milliliters for the NaOH. So the question says, what was the concentration of the sodium hydroxide? Okay. So some things I know about the sodium hydroxide is that I know that it took 0.222 liters to pull a reaction. The question is, what is the concentration? So in order to figure that out, I need to look at the other components of this, which are the volume, concentration, uh, and stoichiometry of sulfuric acid. So 457 milliliters is 0.457 liters times 0.45 molar. We can multiply those two and that comes out to tell us, uh, that comes out to 0 0.206 moles of sulfuric acid. So what we can do with that is we can plug that into our BCA table. I'm actually going to add a digit on there. And then we can go and say, okay, well for every one sulfuric acid, two sodium hydroxides had to react with it. So if all of this has reacted and our reaction is complete, then we know that and this is also used up completely that twice as much, so 0.4114 moles of that reacted. Okay. So what we can then do is we can say, okay, well, we now know how many moles of sodium hydroxide there were in this 222 milliliters or 0.222 liters. So we can figure out the concentration by saying, okay, well, the molarity is going to be equal to this 0.4114 moles of NaOH relative to the 0.222 liters and we get our concentration then of 1.85 molar. So the stoichiometry links in here but we can use this concentration analysis to kind of connect with that to do the full problem. Alright, so the second question that does that combined with perhaps a little more typical analysis for a BCA problem, we have 10 grams of silver nitrate, so silver nitrate here, and then we add that to 500 milliliters, 0.202 molar sodium chloride over here, figure out the limiting reagent, excess reagent, and the mass of silver chloride produced. So what we basically want to do is we want to take both of these and change them into moles. So if we start with the sodium chloride, we have 0.5 liters and then 0.202 molar sodium chloride. So if we multiply those two, we're doing moles per liter times liters. The liters cancel and we end up with 0.101 moles of sodium chloride. And that we can go ahead and plug in here on our BCA. Silver nitrate on the other hand, we're looking at a case where we have 10 grams of silver nitrate and we can divide that by the molar mass of silver nitrate, which is 169.87 grams per mole. So if we do this divided by this, that gives us our moles of silver nitrate, which is 0 0.0589 moles. Now, at this point, we can go through and do our typical BCA analysis. We know everything in here is a 1 to 1 to 1 to 1 ratio. So since we have the least amount of silver nitrate, we know that that's going to be our limiting it's going to react to completion until this is all gone. This is going to decrease by the same amount, but we're going to have some left over. Okay? So we're going to end up with 0 0.0421 moles of sodium chloride left over. And then for these two amounts, we're going to make 0 0.0589 moles for each. So now we can go through and do some analysis of answering all the questions asked about this. First question was, determine the limiting reagent. So the limiting reagent in this case was silver nitrate. Uh, the amount of excess reagent is 0.0421 moles of sodium chloride. So if we want to put that in grams, we can multiply that by 58.44 grams per mole. And that comes out to be 
2.35 grams of sodium chloride. And then the last question is, how much silver chloride do we make? So again, we have 0.0589 moles, and we can go ahead and multiply that by the molar mass of silver chloride, which is 143.32 grams per mole, and we would come up with our 8.44 grams of silver chloride. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at a couple other different examples of questions that you might run into beyond just doing some solution chemistry, uh, concentration, molarity, and that type of thing. So here it says, determine the amount of energy involved. We have 455 grams of methanol burned, uh, and then fill out the LOL diagram that would go with that. So the key for understanding this one is having a solid understanding of what this enthalpy change represents. This is saying that the the chemicals when changing from methanol and oxygen to CO2 and water are accompanied by a change in 1,430 kilojoules per mole of reaction. And what that specifically means is that when two moles of this and three moles of this react to form two moles of this and four moles of that, that the total chemical energy is going to drop by 1,430 kilojoules. So this is not saying 1,430 kilojoules per one mole of one of these, rather it's saying it'll change by 1,430 kilojoules for every two moles of this that react, and every three moles of this that react, and it's kind of combination and constant. So 455 grams of methanol, the first thing we need to do is change that into moles. And so if we take the molar mass of methanol uh, and divide that, so 32.05 grams per mole, uh, this ends up being 14.2 moles of methanol. So what we can then do is we can say, okay, well, 14.2 moles of CH3OH. And we can say, okay, well, we know that for every two moles of methanol, we will produce 1,430 kilojoules of energy change when that burns. So we can do 14.2 divided by 2 times 1,430, and that comes out to be 20,000. 300 kilojoules. So we can look at the question now, determine the amount of energy involved when this much is burned. So 20,300 kilojoules is going to be released. Uh, so that would be our answer to the first question. And then the second part, we're going to look at what actually happens with the energy. So we're going to ignore phase energy in this. We're going to kind of clump that together with chemical. So we're going to start with room temperature methanol that we're going to burn. So two bars of thermal energy. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say that we'll start with two bars of chemical energy. And that's just because that allows us to move up or down. We don't really know how much chemical energy something has. So when the chemical reaction takes place, we know that because this is exothermic, because it's burning, that after the reaction has taken place, the products are going to be hot. Right? So you set something on fire, later it's hot. So the thermal energy goes up, but it didn't go up because I heated it. It went up because a chemical reaction took place. So what's happening is chemical energy is converting to thermal energy. Okay. So because no energy exchange with the system or surroundings in this chemical reaction, if the thermal went up, that means the chemical energy must have gone down. Or in other words, these have a different energy of, based on their arrangements than these particles did. Okay. Then, now we have a hot set of chemicals, and those are going to be interacting with the surroundings, they're going to lose energy, from the system to the surroundings until the thermal energy goes back down to room temperature and we'll still be at a lower point of chemical energy. So this is an exothermic process with respect to the chemicals because the chemicals are losing energy to the surroundings. Okay, and it's important to be able to kind of do this level of analysis alongside these calculations to have a good understanding of what's going on in a chemical reaction with regards to energy. All right. The last one here, this one is also doing some mole stuff, but this time we're doing some uh, ideal gas law analysis with it. So we have 8.09 grams of hydrogen gas. If we divide that by 2.02 grams per mole, then we end up with 4.00 moles of hydrogen. Okay, so it says that we burn all of that with oxygen. Uh, how much steam would be produced? What would the volume of the steam be. Okay, so first of all, we can do our BCA chart. We 
know that all of this is going to react until we have none left. Two moles of oxygen must react. We might have excess. We might not. I don't really know. But we do know that from that we're going to form four moles of steam. So we know our moles of steam. From our BCA chart. From that we can then add on the fact that we know the pressure is 1.76 atmospheres. We know the temperature is 134 plus 273, which is going to be 407 Kelvin. Yep. And we want to know what the volume is. So we're setting up the PV equals NRT or Pevner calculation. So we can just go ahead and plug into our equation PV equals NRT. We get 1.76 atmospheres times volume is equal to 4 moles. And then because the pressure here is in atmospheres, we need to use the atmosphere R value, 0.021. And then the temperature is 407 Kelvin. So this times this times this, divide by 1.76. And we end up with a volume of 75.9 liters. And that volume makes sense because we're looking at a situation where we have four moles. So at standard pressure and temperature, we would have ended up where we would have had, you know, 88 liters or a little over that, 89 point something liters. So we're at a reasonably close thing to that. Uh, we have a almost double the pressure, but we also have the temperature higher than standard as well. So it makes sense that we're within that vicinity. So in all of these, what's really important is that you're able to kind of connect the idea of stoichiometry with this new level of analysis, whether it's PV equals NRT, whether it's enthalpy changes, or whether it's solution chemistry, but all of them have that connection to the recipe of the chemical reaction. And we can look at energy changes, and we can look at volumes of gases, and we can look at energy changes and solution chemistry, and kind of combine those uh, to even more complicated questions.